My name is Jack Morrison, J-A-C-K-M-O-R-R-I-S-O-N, and I'm the boyfriend of Ebony Miller. Your Honor, I'd like to tell you about Ebony and who she was through my eyes. I'd like to tell you our love story. I've waited 195 days to do this, and I'd like to speak my piece. June 1st holds a lot of significance for me. A year ago today, I met the love of my life. It was a warm Wednesday evening on Selby Avenue in St. Paul, and I was sitting inside a horrendous restaurant, <laughs> Moscow on the Hill. Those are Ebony's words, not mine. That night, I anxiously awaited her arrival, facing out the window towards the street, looking for her. The longer I waited, the more anxious I became. For those who don't know me very well, normally I'm the one that's late to things, uh, but for the first time in my life, I was the early one. As I'm looking out the window, I suddenly heard this soft, beautiful voice behind me. She said my name, I turned around, jumped, and screamed a bunch of expletives. It was quite the scene at the restaurant. Those were my first words to Ebony Aaliyah Miller. It wasn't all butterflies initially for me or her, as she immediately bombarded me with a plethora of intense questions about my life and how she could be a part of it. However, as the date went on, we connected on our love of true crime, cats, large families, and boutiques. At that point, I began to fall in love with her and her beautiful soul. By the end of our date, I walked away knowing I had met someone incredibly special who I wanted to be a part of my world. Frankly, I should not be here right now. I should be with her celebrating our one year anniversary today and our love together. I should be preparing to move out to Washington DC with her to begin our new life together as she would tackle medical school at Howard while I would look to find a teaching job in the metro area. All of it was incredibly scary, it was incredibly new and yet something we were both so excited for. Instead, one year to the day I met her I'm here, giving this statement and grieving her every single day. Now, people have touched a lot on Ebony's character, and I don't want to go too deep into it, but let me tell you a little bit of what I saw. She was so kind, leaving everyone that she met with a warm feeling. She was so considerate, always thinking of others and wanting to know how they were doing. She was smart. As you've already heard, academically excelling at every level of schooling, but what I noticed is she was also so, so, so socially aware of everything around her and how she could make everything better. She was funny. She was always ready to pull a prank or fire off a quick-witted comment. She was beautiful. If you look at that photo, you can see the glimmer in her eyes and the soft smile that made everything feel so good. She was so loving. Someone who would go out of her way to make everyone feel so appreciated in half the time they didn't even know who she was. She had the most beautiful laugh. She would cover up her nose when she did it and squint it while throwing her head back. It's my favorite thing about her. And she laughed a lot. She loved soca music, throwing on every opportunity she could. She loved Trader Joe's, always trying and bringing new things to me from there. She loved sunflowers, appreciating their simplistic beauty and warmth. And of course, cheesecake, always commenting on how it hurt her tummy, but always grabbing another slice afterwards. She was a fantastic cook. She was a phenomenal artist and jeweler who shared a piece of who she was through her creations. She was a loving cat mom who spoiled them endlessly, often more than myself. She was a rising star in the medical field with so many career options in front of her. She was doing cancer research at the University of Minnesota, working in the lab tirelessly. She was going to build clinics in the Bahamas, her home country that she was so proud to be from, so she could help women like herself. She spent so many nights telling me about how she could help make an impact on others, and I knew she could every single time. I can confidently say she would have saved tens of thousands of lives. Instead, she's not here. The scars that I've obtained from this nightmarish experience run deep for me. Like the defendant, I too have waged battles with my mental health through periods of my life. But I've never faced a demon like this. 
Early on, there were days where I didn't want to live, where suicidal ideations were commonplace in my mind, just another part of my day. I would find my mind wandering, hoping an opportunity would organically present itself where I could join her in the afterlife and mercifully take this pain away from me. I've had to take considerable time off of work and school. It took me several weeks to return to either activity, and even then, for months I was not mentally present. I found myself in another place often, too numb to effectively interact with customers, classmates, coworkers, and my students. Unfortunately, my students now know this story, which they found, found out through the news, and I had to explain all of it to them. And it's not fair because they were 13 years old. They're, it was also not fair that they were not getting my best every single day because that's what a student should have from their teacher. When I'm at these places, people get to see the old Jack. The Jack who had joy, constantly laughed, cracked dry and sarcastic jokes, and had found peace in his life. When I'm not at these places, though, that part of me no longer exists. It's dead, and people notice that. Unfortunately, I don't think that man will ever return. Every time I say goodbye to someone, I wonder if it's the last time I'll ever hear or see them again. It's like a knife in my heart. I have panic attacks constantly, especially when a legal date like today is on the horizon. I cry almost every day. I'm not a crier at all. I've, anyone that knows me knows I, I can be emotional, but I don't cry. But I have, because I miss the person that made my life so peaceful and beautiful, and know that she can't come back. My friends and family have stepped up admirably, and I'm so thankful for them. They have done so much, and without them I wouldn't have graduated, I wouldn't have done the four jobs I had to work and teach my students every single day and get out of bed. But I still have the scars. As for the defendant, I have no concerns he'll be a threat to myself and my family. However, I'm concerned about what will happen to the community if the defendant does not make considerable and profound efforts to make a positive and meaningful change in his life. If the defendant is to receive probation, I would like the following conditions. These are my opinions, of course, and I know that you have the best judgment. But if he receives probation, I want the maximum amount of community service. But this could be, should be community service that actually goes towards bettering someone, helping someone else that is going through a tough time, just like Ebony would want but I want all of it with strict supervision. I want the maximum amount of mental health and chemical dependency evaluations that the state can give, with additional requirements that defendant do take their medication for their underlying mental health conditions, with strict supervision. And lastly, I would request that the defendant undergo the maximum amount of classes for anger management and other behavioral needs that the state can mandate, once again, with strict supervision. I just have a few more things to say, Your Honor. On November 18th, I found out about the accident 12 hours after it occurred. I woke up that morning incredibly happy. I was with my roommate back in my parents' home. I texted Ebony, good morning, my love. I hope you have a wonderful day. Every morning I would text her that or I would receive a text similar. As I drove up to the cities, I played our favorite song, Heaven by Callum Scott. If you ever get the opportunity to listen to that song, that reminds me of her a lot. When I heard there was an accident, I was at school teaching a class. I got a call from her best friend, Kiki. I sprinted out of the school and ran straight to my car before rushing to the hospital, not knowing her fate. The entire way I was calling friends, family, and the Hennepin County Medical Center, trying to rally everyone there. However, when I called to HCMC, I was given the number to the Hennepin County Medical Examiner out of Minnetonka. At the time, I didn't really think anything of it, just questioning why she would be there. She, it didn't make much sense geographically. Her work wasn't that far from her home. When I called the number, the woman who answered told me I could not see her without giving a reason. I demanded why, stating that I was her closest contact in Minnesota and her boyfriend, and said, I don't care, I'm coming to see her. The woman once again kept pushing back, and we argued for a couple minutes. When I finally demanded why, she uttered four words that will forever play in my mind because she passed away. The next five minutes were a numbing blur. I've never felt my body transition the way it had. 
I just kept driving, knowing all I need to do is get to her apartment and be with her cats, Anakin and Evie, who she loved and cherished so much. I only came to when my mother called and asked me how she was and what had happened. When I informed her what happened, I heard a scream come from her that continues to ring through my mind and honestly will forever. This is not the first time my mom has lost a loved one, as she has stated before. And when I heard that scream, I knew it was not only the scream of pain for Ebony and her family, but also the scream of someone who knew their child was just entering the hells of a world she had once experienced herself as a child. I spent the night on Ebony's floor, sobbing with her cats next to me, and with family and friends rushing to get there. I had friends calling frantically, hoping I wouldn't kill myself. The next few days were a blur. It was just a numbing pain. Just days prior, I was in her apartment with the love of my life, laughing, dancing, and smiling. And just days later, I had to move her stuff out of her apartment. When I saw her, I'll never forget the pain and love I felt. She looked incredibly beautiful, in spite of all the imaginable, unimaginable damage that had been done. Thankfully, I only see her beauty. And I see these photos, and they now make me smile. But on that day, in those moments, my heart broke. My girlfriend believed in second chances. Her heart and ability to forgive are larger than that of anyone in this room. She got that from her lovely mother and family, who I'm proud to say will be my family forever. Ebony was a better person than I could ever hope to be. When it comes to the decision of the defendant's punishment, I want to be as compassionate as she would be. But frankly, I'm biased. I'm angry. I want to make that very clear. As a teacher, I believe that actions have consequences, and when someone messes up, they need to atone for their mistakes. They need to own it, and they need to handle the consequences. But I also understand I need to let go of this hate and anger. Ebony would want that, and frankly, I need to as well, because hate is like a poison, and it can only take me. So, Your Honor, I want to place this judgment in your hands, because I cannot give you an unbiased suggestion. If you think that placing the defendant in prison is the best way to change them for the better, do it. But if you truly believe that probation and rehabilitation will give him a, a second chance and make him a better person, max out the requirements and go that route. You know better than me. A wise pastor once said, there's a lonely arena in the depths of your heart where the greatest battles of life will be fought alone. I fought those battles for the last 195 days. I'm proud to say I haven't been beaten. I will graduate without her. I'll have to find a teaching job without her. I'll have to find a new beautiful partner and have a bunch of beautiful children, all without her. My dreams with her died, but I will do everything I can to make sure her dream of helping others and improving their lives will continue in her memory. When we first began dating, I told her whether we were together for five minutes or 50 years, I will have just been happy that you were part of it. I'm so blessed I got to spend the best six my, months of my life with her. She was and forever will be my soulmate, love of my life. I miss her so much. Fifty years ago, an intoxicated driver took my uncle, his wife, and unborn child. But my grandparents found the strength to forgive him. Starting now, I will begin to find that same strength and forgive the defendant as well. I hope that they not only forgive themselves, but take this opportunity to actually grow and change. They have been given so many chances, so I hope they finally take advantage of this one. With that, I wash my hands of this and will yield my time. Thank you. Carmen Miller, K-E-R-M-I-T, M-I-L-L-E-R. I am the father of Ebony Miller. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Um, I have had a lot of time to process this. I'm here representing her, but I'm also representing the Commonwealth of the Palms. Ab 
happening with the rain. I sent my child away on education, and now she's on a box on my wall. Cautious because of these selfish things to the reaction of one individual and a habitual offender. So I'm not, I'm not here to forgive. There's no forgiveness for me because it was a choice that he made to drive drunk under the influence. That was a choice, a conscious choice. I'm here to ask the court to just look at the evidence before the court, its history, its intent, what he did, the circumstances surrounding this accident. And you know, you guys, you are in the U.S. system, we're in the Westminster system of, of, of law, and the maximum penalty here does not in any way, shape, or form fit the crime. You know, his actions were unforgivable in my, in my eyesight. Um, it's just a tragedy, you know, it changed so many things. And not only did he take away my daughter, he took away my lineage, my bloodline. He took away my life investment. He took away me, that is me, right there, that's me. So, like I said, my words are short and few, but I just want to know that what he did was was, was, it was preventable, and this court should sentence him to the maximum and then some for what he did. So I'll have to say, Your Honor. Mr. Spencer, you do not have to say anything, but you have the right to speak to the court directly before I sentence you. Okay. You can, of course, speak to the family as well, um, but for the most part, I'd ask that you direct your comments to the, to the bench, to the court, okay? Okay. What would you like to say, sir? I have a, <coughs> I have an apology, I have an apology letter. Okay. You can scooch the mic up a little closer to you, okay? <coughs> To the Miller, <coughs> sorry, to the Miller family. My name is Kenneth Spencer Jr. I'm reaching out to the family on the behalf of the expressing my deepest condolences of the loss of a life that I removed from you all. I'm not sure what can bring the family full closure, but I hope and pray that this letter can be a start and bring Hill into the death that should not have happened. It's very emotional to even think about, and I'm mentally not here. It hurts me every time I think about it. I know Miss Miller had goals to complete. She seemed like a very great human. I wish I could trade places with her every day. I should be gone not Miss Miller. I'm really lost and would like help. I cannot forgive myself. And drugs and alcohol took my life over. I would take all the help that I can get. And this can be a start of honor in Ms. Miller's life. Every day I wish I could, I could have gotten out and helped her. But I was too hurt myself to, at the time, to do anything but stand outside my car. This is very hard to deal with, and I consider myself a kind-hearted person that would never take someone's life. And most definitely wouldn't leave a family hurt and in pain. I'm in a pair, I am in prayers for the family and as my family as well. I hope the family can find it in your hearts to forgive me eventually. There's no words that I can say that will bring Miss Miller back or change what I did. That happened that night on, of November 18th. I do hope you can find it in your hearts to forgive me. And that is all I have to say. Is there anything additional from either party before I proceed to sentencing? Nothing from the state judge. Nothing further, Your Honor. 